Actually, I think um,
Those watching on the live stream can hear this, but we're going to be starting in about five minutes. Sorry about that. We'll be starting in about two minutes.
Hello, everyone. So we uh, have finished the official morning panels. How is it going so far? Yeah, a few thumbs up. Nobody booing yet? Okay, good. So um, we're going to talk about uh, pathways to global surgery. I imagine that not everybody here is at the same stage. So can I just do a quick show of hands survey? Who is in a pre-clinical, pre-medical stage of their training? Okay. Sorry, when I, when I say that, what I mean is pre-medical school. Okay, good. Glad to have you join us. Medical school. A lot of you. Uh, people who are in a uh, beyond medical school uh, part of their training, so residency. Great, a few of you. And anybody beyond their residency? Uh, and then, of course, other professions that are non-medical. Well, nursing. <laughs> and, and entirely non-medical. What do you do? Uh, I'm a physics grad student. Pardon me? Uh, physics grad student. Excellent, physics grad student. So... There's lots of ways that people can be involved in this uh, big effort that we're calling global surgery. And um, not everybody's going to have the same uh, pathway. Not everybody's going to have the same response, level of involvement, type of involvement. So um, ask the questions that you think pertain to you, and our speakers will respond um, from their experience. Uh, we have um, a, a variety of training as well in our panel here. So I'll just let the speakers introduce themselves and share maybe a couple uh, points of information about uh, what their background is that got them into global surgery and um, where they are now. I'm Andrew, I should probably have mentioned. I'm Andrew Giles, I'm a, uh, I'm a general surgery resident uh, training at McMaster University and completing my MPH at uh, the Harvard Chan School of Health, Public Health here this year. And I got into uh, global surgery, I think, uh, largely because of uh, my background. My parents were both raised internationally, and so I've always had a bit of that perspective and thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, it was evident that it was going to be medical and then became surgical, and a lot of those formative experiences were uh, in uh, international settings like Angola, uh, which will probably come up once or twice. Um, and a lot of my mentors have been in this field, uh, and I can see the, the great value in it, and that's why I pursued it. I'm Bruce Steppes. I'm a general uh, surgeon, uh, int intensivist, was in private practice, and quit my... It's on, I think. I can hear it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Quit my uh, practice in 97 and been involved in the developing world ever since that time. I've spent the last 11 years uh, being involved as the... Uh, CEO of the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, which is a general surgical training program that's in eight countries in Africa. I'm Robert Riviello. Um, I'm a, a general acute care surgeon at Brigham Women's Hospital that split, I split my time between uh, Boston and, and Rwanda, largely. Every year has been a little different how that split goes. Uh, nine month, three month, three month, nine months, six months, six months, et cetera. Um, I was... Uh, when I finally, my, my family's from Argentina, so I grew up as in a bicultural home in Southern California, and the, the experience of uh, living in, in two cultures, the exposures to poverty in a middle-income country, and then um, and the exposures to uh, faith-based practitioners made me think I would work uh, full-time as a, as a faith-based uh, healthcare worker in um, Rural Missions Hospital in Africa. Along the way, I figured something out about education and teaching and, and had a draw there and sort of found myself as an academic trying to merge those two worlds. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Nicole Reichar. I'm a general surgery resident at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So I. Uh, up higher. Okay. I um, spent uh, three years. Um, so my path to global surgery kind of is, I think, similar to a lot of the people in this room and very similar to <coughs> sort of what Robert described in terms of um, 
an interest in sort of disparities in social justice and all of those uh, aspects and, uh, and uh, being exposed to <clears throat> other cultures and societies. And uh, this was a great way to sort of combine all of those things and uh, a passion for surgery. Um, so I ended up being uh, in the right place at the right time. Uh, started general surgery residency here uh, at this point seven years ago. And, uh, and then uh, in my first year, uh, did a rotation here at Children's Hospital and, and uh, met John Mira. I also you know, was Googling random stuff uh, and uh, found Robert Riviello's name uh, as <coughs> being affiliated with PGSSC, shot off some random emails. And uh, soon enough, I was you know, meeting them. And uh, <coughs> at the end of my third year, uh, signed on for uh, two years uh, of the Paul Farmer Global Surgery Fellowship stayed an extra year, so did three, and then now just came back um, and finishing out the last two years of uh, general surgery residency. Uh, got to meet these guys and uh, you know all the people that uh, have uh, presented today, so it's a pretty infectious sort of uh, you know, pathway, uh, to say the least. Are you saying surgery is an infectious disease? There we go, <laughs> there we go. even better. Now there's the funding for it. Social disease. <laughs> pull it forward. Yeah. Uh, my name is Swagate Makapadia, or everyone calls me Swag. Um, so I'm a general surgery resident at the University of Connecticut. My interest in global health and global surgery, um, nothing terribly unique. Uh, I, I grew up until I was about 10, 11 in Calcutta. Uh, my parents worked in public hospitals there, and uh, they were one of the surprising groups of people who... Um, even though they were from a middle-income country, they had dedicated their time to work in other low- and middle-income countries, and so I had uh, early exposure to global health and global surgery. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, <laughs> so um, like, like I was saying, I mean, I basically traveled around a bit when I was younger with my parents who were health practitioners, and uh, it was interesting coming from an Indian setting, which is already not a considered a high income setting, but um, you know, dedicating time and volunteering time and effort uh, pretty consistently around the world in settings that were far worse off, uh, even though technically they're at the same level. And uh, moving to the US and, you know, I, so I think uh, like Nicole said, the interest in social justice came on very early, um, but that expanding just just expanded and kind of stuck around uh, as I went through my education process. And um, I ended up at PGSSC. Uh, Nicole was one of the people that interviewed me to be one of the fellows. And, uh, and one of the people, one of the, my senior residents had been a prior fellow who was actually the first fellow in the program when it started about seven years ago. Um, and you know, we just realized we had very similar interests. And so one day randomly, I guess he had contacted Dr. Mira and I got a call from Dr. Mira asking me if I was interested in applying for the program. And so um, that's how I got into the program. And then you heard some about all the things that have developed since uh, over the last few years that, that you know, all, all the people up here have been involved with. Great, so uh, we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, any questions that you'd have? And just so you know, for the purposes of the, uh, the streaming and the recording, I'm gonna be repeating uh, your question on the mic. Um, what fields within surgery, if any, do you think um, are most pressing in the context of global surgery? Thank you. I love it that you had the, the if any at this point. Um, <laughs> so I think global surgery is global, and I think global burden of disease is global. Um, I think it would be hard-pressed to, uh, in any sort of large geopolitical area, to say this... Expert, set of expertise isn't, doesn't apply because this 
epidemiology doesn't exist. Um, an anecdote I shared with uh, shared earlier was I used to think I mean, we would make an example before to this question, saying, "Well, you know, if you're going to pick amongst fields, and you know, you want to think something that's going to have an application, so maybe not minimally invasive vascular surgery, because in Rwanda, people there's very little cigarette smoking because overall people are too poor, um, and by the way, we just don't have vascular disease. Well, it turns out we do have vascular disease, and when you start doing a lot of bilateral above knee amputations in middle-aged uh, women with your residents, and, and now that you can actually do some imaging and realize they have bilateral, not occlusive disease, but bilaterally occluded iliac arteries, that's a vascular disease burden. Um, you may not, they're not going to be set up for a minimally invasive piece of that anytime soon. Um, so I think uh, there is, you know, we've heard this several times now, there is an overwhelming uh, epidemiology around the world that requires uh, expertise in surgical delivery, all aspects of it, the anesthesia, the surgery, et cetera. Um, so, uh, you know, almost by virtue, not by virtue of sitting in here, but the fact that you're sitting here uh, most likely means that you have, uh, regardless of where you started from, you have enormous range of possibilities ahead of you. Um, and I think that comes with uh, a certain level of responsibility to acknowledge that you are built hardwired in certain ways. There are some things that attract you and some things that don't. You've had life experiences that have drawn you to certain fields or certain people and the others that repel you. Um, I think it's worth listening to that. If uh, this is a, a long-term endeavor, right? Uh, those of you in the, in the education panel heard Dr. Steffi's talk about sacrifice and long-term commitment. Um, I was referencing Farmer's quote in Mountains Beyond Mountains, quoting from J.R. Tolkien, speaking of Galadriel, the queen of the elves, they're fighting the long fight. Um, and this is the elves fighting over ages against the forces of darkness or injustice. Um, this is fighting, fighting the long fight. So find something that you, find a set of tools that you enjoy working with. Um, renal transplant, that seems really not useful. Oh, turns out there's a renal transplant program in Rwanda now because there's a huge chronic kidney disease burden because we have a big hypertensive burden. Um, so I think you have uh, a set of opportunities ahead of you and you have things that draw you and, and listen to that. I would like to just add to that. I think just go ahead and get trained in general surgery with a component of thoracic, vascular, ENT, head and neck, uh, <laughs> urology, <laughs> yeah, urology, OBGYN, and yeah. so forth, and then you'll be qualified. Uh, the, the reality is you're never going to be qualified uh, if you're going to go to the rural areas because you're, just, you're literally going to be skinning its contents. I think uh, what... Uh, What's your name again? Um, Bob. <laughs> Bob. Uh, what Dr. Riviello has, um, has mentioned is true. Is It's your passion, whatever that is. And, and admit, realize, though, that any decision has some consequences. If you're going to say that you're going to only specialize in the left kidney transplant, you know, there's going to be a limited number of places where that's going to be uh, possible. But by definition, you will be gaining skills the rest of your life because you won't have sufficient numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you can add to that general surgery training anesthesiology as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of you mentioned. Yeah, just one second. I'll bring the mic up. Better for his exercise too. <laughs> okay. A lot of you mentioned um, that you sometimes have a hard time finding funding or, you know, it's not global surgery or even just global um, medical careers are hard to come by for financial support. So I was just wondering how you make your careers in global surgery sustainable, um, whether that be financially or just with family, um, all that good stuff. Like, how do you actually make this happen on a day-to-day -day basis? Because um, it sounds like you're living the dream, but I just want to know how you made it happen. <laughs> for Nicole and I, it's pretty easy. Our, our residency subsidizes us, so I think that's more relevant for, for you guys. There's also the advice that how do you make a small fortune? You start with a big one. So being independently wealthy is... <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I, I, this is kind of part of extension of what I was saying in the other group. Uh, it's a sacrifice. 
Um, you're going to have to negotiate with your employers to be gone for three and four and five months, and I promise you they're not going to pay you while you're gone. Uh, you're going to have to, you know, make uh, decisions about uh, how you swap that. Now, exactly what that looks like, uh, universities are increasingly, because global surgery is sexy, uh, they want you to be involved with it, but of course that means they're not going to hire you unless you actually have the experience, so you had to somehow figure out how you can have the experience. Uh, part of the issue, honestly, is you can't come out of medical school owing three hundred and four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars because you know so that that kind of cultural countercultural lifestyle has to start relatively early because otherwise uh, the yeah. people who've loaned you the money are going to let you go. So that's part of the issue, uh, but it's it's a matter of trying to figure out some situation where um, it will it'll affect your career. There's no question about it. Uh, it may build it, but it'll take twenty years to do that. Uh, but nobody's ever going to pay you for that. You just get to go to conferences and, like uh, we saw this morning, fancy rooms at Bellagio, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's something that you're going to have to work on. Now, one of the things that actually works reasonably well is to consider working for the VA. Because especially if there's an academic appointment there, you get to keep your academic piece, but they're used to paying people in eighths. You know? And so they, you might work for a VA for five-eighths or something or a half. Uh, full-time equivalent, and that'll give you the time and the ability in a system that will permit you to then leave and come back and, and go back and forth as you go. So that's a real option. Occasionally, if you're lucky, you'll get in private practice with two or three people who feel the way you do, but that doesn't happen real often. And I think um, similar to the VA piece, you know, you, you're negotiating how much you're going to get paid for. Um, I'm not supposed to say this. I, it's, it's in my contract. I'm not supposed to talk about this. So when I signed my contract to Brigham, um, and they paid me three quarters of the starting salary. Um, you didn't hear that here, and it's not a recorded. Um, but <laughs> for the same reasons that you would do in a private practice. I'm going to be here for nine months, so we'll get nine months' worth of salary. The, the stuff I did over there, it was probably my fifth year here when people stopped asking me how my vacation was when I got back from Rwanda. Um, <clears throat> So it, it uh, actually, there's a slide that was in Dr. Steffi's uh, slide deck that the organizers of the, of the conference cut for him, um, <laughs> which I'm going to reference. Um, and so there's, it asks about if you're, I think it's interested versus committed? Yeah, it, it's, yeah. It's, uh, it's about a Midwestern breakfast and the pig and the, and the chicken. The chicken is interested, the pig is committed. And so I think that's really what you have to make that decision for yourself as well. <laughs> 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 I like how the crowd, the, the, the laugh yeah, yeah. through. I think hey, you're a little slow this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think uh, I see a pattern here. Everybody's at the top. Just to add to that really, really quickly, um, you know, I think that as I'm nearing the end of my uh, surgical training period uh, and looking to sort of get jobs in this field, I think what... What Dr. Aviello has done is, is actually um, pretty unique, and um, it's probably good of all of us to recognize that uh, <clears throat> that sort of thing takes time, and you've got to sort of establish uh, credibility at an institution. You've got to show them that you are worth their time, uh, both in terms of the services and values that you bring to them uh, domestically and at the institution, as well as you know, what you uh, do when you're perhaps not here. Um, but there, on the bright side, you know, I think that's true of anybody going into any academic career. Um, when you are yeah. starting a research career, you know, you're not going to, you may have gotten a PhD in medical school or during residency or whatever it is, but when you start that first academic job as a junior attending surgeon, <clears throat> you know, nobody's going to be throwing four research assistants at you in a lab and this and that. You know, you've got you've to build that. You've got to apply to those grants, and you've got to sort of create that zone around yourself. And um, I think fortunately in that sphere, a lot has changed over the last five years even uh, in terms of research funding available to these sorts of projects. Um, I remember trying to uh, secure funding for my, you know, my Paul Farmer Global Surgery Fellowship, and it was, it was very, very difficult, um, you know, it just wasn't in the sort of funding stream of 99% of the places that I looked. Uh, that has changed. Uh, there are more and more places that are able to sort of, you can, you can sort of mold your application towards. And then I think we've, as a community, gotten much better 
at selling what we do uh, mm. to organizations that are funders and uh, showing them this is just as relevant as X, Y, and Z and other things that they fund. And a lot of that, you know, it's uh, the onus is on us to sort of prove the worth of the work that we uh, that we are that we're doing. Um, so aside from the payment and the work side of it, do you have room for, for volunteers, people who don't want to get paid? We just want the humanitarian side of it. As uh, IMGs, we've done a lot of that where we graduated from. And it would mean a lot for us to continue that whilst we're doing our USMLEs. Do we have to finish our board exam and find a residency program within the surgical field to be able to um, like participate and help with what you guys are doing? Or is there room for us now? Um, so for at least what the, the program that we're talking about, there's, there's always room. Um, and we have applicants every year from a variety of places. And um, I think I think one of the things that's very unique about our program, and, uh, you know, there might be some drawbacks, but one of the positive aspects is that it's a very egalitarian, uh, you know, um, program where the catchment for the people who we draw from is very broad, uh, not just within the U.S. but beyond the U.S. And so, um, <clears throat> which sometimes comes with it, with its own problems in terms of visas and things like that, but. I think because our draw is much broader, it, the conversations that we have and the backgrounds of the people that we have really make a lot of the work that we do much more meaningful um, for both the people that we collaborate with as well as the people who are within our program. And so, no, I think there are plenty of opportunities. Um, it's a difficult path, just knowing some of, my, some of the friends that I've made who have walked that path. I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult path, but it's there are opportunities for sure. I think also more broadly, uh, there are a lot of different ways to get involved uh, and make a contribution in global health and global surgery, particularly. And you know, it doesn't all <clears throat> very little of it uh, really has to has to be clinical. Um, a lot of it can be on the on the research end. A lot of it can be on the advocacy end. I think a lot of the work that um, we've been doing uh, in India, for example, through the Lancet Commission and PGSSC is centered on sort of long-term partnerships with surgeons in India who are, are already doing this work and just wanted sort of some empowerment from the outside. You know, they're, uh, after the, the Lancet Commission came out, um, they came to, they essentially a, a group of them said, hey, you know, we helped you guys a lot in terms of providing data, providing input, providing our opinions and advice, and you guys came to us all the time. Um, so what are you going to, what are you going to do for us? Um, you know, this, this report is great and, you know, it, it sounds good, but, you know, how is that going to impact what we do on a daily basis? And I think what they were looking for and what has blossomed thereafter was, Sort of, you know, they they feel like they are <clears throat> surgeons across the world. No matter where we're, we're talking about, uh, are working hard every day. Uh, they're taking care of patients, and they're not getting the adulation. They're not getting the glory of sort of uh, of doing anything great. Um, and especially in in lower resource settings, people who stay behind uh, to to work in those areas are, you know, not celebrated at all, right? They're the quote unquote schmucks who didn't, you know, didn't make it to, to sort of train in the US or train in the in, in other systems. And so they're, you know, really working very, very hard, not getting that um, not getting that recognition and often don't feel empowered to um, to sort of take it to the next level and advocate for surgery or for their patients. Uh, and uh, sometimes just providing support from another academic institution in another part of the world and saying, hey, listen, I work at, you know, <clears throat> with uh, whether it's the Lancet Commission or Harvard Medical School or whatever medical school or whatever it is, uh, and uh, providing writing support for grants or writing support for projects that they're working on or, uh, you know, uh, coordinating volunteerism. You know, it's uh, it's really difficult uh, for many surgeons in different parts of the world to to get a week off, right? If you're the if you're the only surgeon 
for two million people, you work all the time uh, and you don't leave. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, you, occasionally you'll have visitors from here and there, but that's not really useful. What is useful is to know that, you know, I have a board certified surgeon who I know and I trust who uh, is willing to come to my community for two weeks in September and, uh, you know, uh, can maybe give me, give me a few days off with my family and to do other things. Tiny little detailed piggyback on that. So you, one could be that board certified surgeon who has that longitudinal relationship, uh, but most of you in the room are not. I think all of you said so. But even the effort of coordinating, I don't know if you caught that word, of coordinating the visits and, and being the liaison, a lot of this um, is a huge effort because uh, unlike most surgeons here, I know almost no surgeons in other countries that have a secretary, somebody who can answer emails and make invites. And those things of doing the communications piece uh, opens up enormous doors. And frankly, a lot of our students, uh, all these programs have really run done administrative tasks that have blossomed into huge impact. And to add to that, this is, a lot of this is focused on sort of the clinical and, and coordinating clinical side of things, but one of the things that we uh, don't always think about is what about equipment and who mm -hmm. takes care of the equipment? You know, if you have, you have to have an operating room, you have to have things that work in the operating room, but if your scalpels um, don't fit the blades and if you're uh, scissors don't cut, then you're in trouble. And so then it really helps to have a friend who knows some engineering or some something about tool maintenance. So there's really is a role, and research is uh, not just research here, but research in these places, collecting data, reporting data. There's a lot that comes to this, and so there's even a need for people who have training in statistics and training in, you name it, there's a role for you. So um, part of that is getting connected and knowing where you fit in the picture, but I think absolutely there's a place. Next question. Top. Once again. <laughs> if you have a question, please go to the top row. <laughs> so it's my understanding that the number of physicians that travel to each country doesn't necessarily reflect the need of that country for the number of surgeons that travel there. And I was wondering if any of you can speak to what goes into the decision making about which country you're going to go to help. Hmm. Okay, I'm sure I totally understood. That. I mean, how do people pick if they're going to do some volunteerism? How do they pick where they're going to go? Yeah, I mean, from your perspective, are you asking about clinical care or research or? I think the answer is going to be the same. If there is no system. Yeah, yeah. there's absolutely no system. Um, it's all based on, it's all. Excuse the, forgive me for the blanket statements. Um, I'm post con a little punchy. Um, most of these things are based on relationships. You know, so-and-so knew so-and-so, and gosh, could you come? Okay, that sounds kind of cool. And well, Maybe I'll come again. And next time I'll bring a friend. And maybe you should come my way next time. And I mean, institutions are made up of individuals, and... Partnerships are made of institutions talking to institutions. Um, I think things that play in is, so there's the relational piece. Um, other things that make people travel or not travel are things as basic as security, language, uh, how comfortable your family is with you heading that way. Um, the notion that there are others that you know doing similar things in that space and so you're part of a, a bigger group. I ended up in Rwanda because Brigham Women's Hospital already had deep ties to Rwanda through the internal medicine side and partners in health side, but there was no surgical component there. Um, so I think there's lots of things, and it's certainly not um, the, the, the distribution of human workforce is not based on an equity agenda. I think one of the biggest uh, issues, both uh, Operation Giving Back with mm -hmm. the American College of Surgeons and uh, some efforts now with COSEX and some other, they're trying to track that or, mm. or regulate it. Uh, it's roughly the whole problem of herding cats. I don't personally think they're gonna be able to do it very successfully. So I think it's all the things that you mentioned. Mm. What, um, what resources would there be? Say that you had no geographical or political preference. What resources would there be to make a determination about where best to go? 
How, how does one go about making a decision like that? I, I mean, I, I think that uh, kind of dovetailing off what Dr. Riviello said, um, you know, the first thing is you, you need to be, all things equal, you need to be wanted in that, in that place, mm -hmm. right? It's not mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. as picking a place on the map and saying, oh, there's no surgeons there, I'm a surgeon, or there's no X there, you know, I can provide that service. Uh, place may not be set up for you. Uh, people may not find the value of, of, of you being there. Um, I think, <coughs> you know, the more you think about this, the, the more uh, it comes out of the woodworks in terms of unintended consequences mm -hmm. of uh, foreign visitors uh, in low resource environments. I mean, it's the, the it like stuff that I never could have imagined could be an issue, right? With two people working uh, together with really the best of intentions and just this plethora of things that spring up around you between sort of how locals perceive local care uh, when you're not there versus, uh, you know, just many things. So I think that there needs to be sort of a, a, a really important link is that there's got to be somebody who you know who says, there's a role for you, we really need you, and I want you to do this, and can you do this? Uh, and if you can, then it's, it's worth uh, sort of going down that route. And where it's an institutional commitment, even better, right? Because generally, a lot of those kinks are worked out uh, at the institutional level, and you can sort of, you can fit in there. But, but I guess to the, the point of everyone else is that, you know, many of the places in, in most need may not have uh, institutional commitments that are likely not to have those, so. Robert this morning in his uh, presentation was talking about the uh, criticality of humility. And what I think is important is no matter where you go, you need to go to serve their agenda, not your own. Uh, one of the big issues that you get into often, we come and we're going to accomplish what we wish to accomplish. And because they're polite, they'll let you, uh, but you haven't accomplished anything. Uh, I, I remember when I was working in Uganda in 2005 at Malago, uh, I was looking, uh, at that time, Indiana was one of the few places that, Indiana University was one of the few places that had a good program at Eldorat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was looking at it from a surgical standpoint, uh, you know, how did we put that up and how do we look at twinning? And that's when we first started talking about that uh, a decade or so ago. Anyway, I found two excellent articles that, that describe this program that I think were absolutely phenomenal. I'm thinking, this is great. This needs to be spread elsewhere. This is wonderful. I'm all in favor of this. And as I read further, I found out that they were both at Malago Hospital. And I'd been there for over a year and never heard of either one of them. <laughs> and so I think it's very, very important that we have to realize that when we come, there has to be a true quid pro quo. We're giving, we may be getting something out of it, but we have to give something that's of some value to them uh, out of it. And otherwise, we're just being rich tourists who are coming to massage our guilt uh, rather than to, uh, to actually accomplish what needs to be accomplished. So uh, again, one of these things go with an attitude of being a servant. Mm. That's a great point. Those comments. We have time for one last question. Top row. Oh. <laughs> Very <laughs> top. <laughs> So, so people around the world can hear you. No pressure. <laughs> Sorry. What's that? Yeah, that's good. Sabotage. So as a medical student, given the huge emphasis on basic um, science research, how do you present yourself if you have a passion for global health and Global surgery, so you can still look sexy, you know, for residents. Well, if you're a surgeon, you have no choice but look sexy. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. um, I think the see if I can remember this. I don't remember this right, but somewhere in the mission statement for Harvard Medical School, the mission statement of Harvard Medical School is to decrease suffering uh, wherever it may be found around the world, something along those lines. Um, so yes, you, we, all, if we're, if we're, we need to be able to speak the language of the people who are listening to you. Uh, you need to be able to speak your message in that language, whether that language is Kenya Rwanda or academic, academic ease. Um, and so, yes, it doesn't sound like you wanna do basic science research and I'm with you. Um, but you need to demonstrate the value proposition of who you are and what you want to be and the value proposition to the people listening to you. So if you're at 
Medical School X, and their mission statement is to do something along those lines. And you want to work in a space that's delivering healthcare to those who uh, have the greatest need, and therefore you, the work you're doing has the uh, the opportunity for the biggest impact over time. Uh, basic science research based around the square mile we're in uh, is astounding and largely benefits the richest 5% of people in the world. Uh, you're working on looking at the stuff that's maybe, how do you get some of that stuff to the other 95%? Or how do you create new knowledge that is contextually uh, going to impact the people in the other pick a percent, percentile or decile? Um, I think that's the, the piece you need to figure out, know that language. It's cross-cultural work, uh, being in academics. you got to understand academic ease. Um, and be fast with that language with your own agenda. One of the things that's important is to realize that in some places you're not going to be able to do the research component of it as much as just the teaching component of mm -hmm. it. There are entire <coughs> countries that do not have basic scientists of any sort. There's nobody in their medical school who can teach anatomy or physiology yeah. or any of those things. And so uh, just being able to go and share, even if you're doing your research on this side, if you go in there and just being able to, to teach a course so that they can come out of medical school or understand the rest of their medical school at a level that's acceptable is a big step forward. Uh, we were looking at, and, and one of the things that we can do is we can perhaps um, do telemedicine kind of lectures or something like that, but the truth is that doesn't build any competency, except for perhaps in the IT department, but it doesn't do anything for the, for the physiology or the anatomy. And so I think it's one of these things where going there and working with people and helping them build their competence so that they can, over a period of five, six, 10, 15 years, actually give those same lectures and then and, and build up the expertise they need to make a difference in their own countries is critical. There are a lot of medical schools that, that have no basic science, except for whatever they pick up. And boy, is that obvious when it comes to uh, when we try to train at the next level. Thank you very much to uh, the audience. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for your questions. Don't go just yet. Uh, and thank you to our panelists um, for your insight. I'm going to turn it over now to Parissa for some final words. Actually, um, before I give my final words, um, part of the reason we have this organization is because we're collaborating with students everywhere. And so someone from Yale has something to share before I close. Mm. Great. Um, my name is Taylor Audison. I'm a medical student at Yale School of Medicine. And um, can we just recognize how great this has been today to come and, yeah. It takes a lot of effort and work to herd 100 or 200 people through all these different lectures and panels and get everything organized and feed us all. And if you've noticed, they've all been walking around and doing a lot of work. So we need to recognize them and we're thankful for they, that they did all that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to um, let you know that, as we said, networking and understanding and meeting other people who are interested in your field and getting mentors and doing things are very important as, uh, as in addition to learning about this. Yale will be holding a global surgery symposium at Yale on April 1st. So um, we will send out that information. Um, I'll forward it to her, or you can come talk to me afterwards. So if you'd like to continue to learn more about how you can get involved with global surgery and, and connect across various schools as well, we'd love to have you at Yale. Um, there is no registration cost, but we would like you to register quickly so we have an idea of the number of people so we can plan on different things. So, But again, this has been excellent, and we'd love to have you also come to Yale. Thank you. Yes. I want to make another plug for the Yale event. Um, a man that I referred to as my father in surgery, uh, John Lehman Tarpley, is the keynote speaker flying in from Rwanda. Um, he will not disappoint. <laughs> okay, so if we can give another round of applause to our panelists and all of our speakers today. Um, they dedicated part of their Saturday, which for many is time with family, um, in order to be here to speak with and inspire you all. So thank you so much. Um, before we close, I need to thank quite a few people. 
Um, first of all, I want to introduce the team of students that made this all possible. They have put in significant time and energy to make this symposium and this national team a reality while juggling medical school, research projects, and more. So um, I actually couldn't have asked for a better group of students to work with. So I'm going to call them up by name and have them stand up here because they deserve a lot of recognition. Um, from Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Dental Medicine, we have Isaac Alti, Nicole Beck, Christy, come on down guys, um, Austin Erbst, um, Kevin King, Sarah Osmulski, Jason Young, and Marvy Turk. Come on guys. <laughs> Stand in front of the, yeah, you can come back here. Yeah, we're a family. Um, <laughs> from BU Med, we have Roya Adalatpur, Christina Kemenita, Ray Yoon, and Prachi Patel. Come on up. You guys, stand, the live streaming feed is going to be. Um, and then from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, we have two amazing general surgery residents who kindly work with our team of medical students and have given so much of their time, advice, and knowledge throughout the whole process. So Andrew Giles and Adriana Ramirez. You know. Stand over here. So these students also comprise our national um, GSSA team running our development, advocacy, education, and research arms, as well as our resident and trainee branch. So you can go to our website to learn more about them and see what role they play. And should you have any specific questions for them, their emails are also listed. Um, we would also like to give a huge thank you to the audiovisual communications team here at Harvard Med. Um, they are the reason why we were able to basically live stream this across the country and around the world. Um, and we've received feedback on Twitter that people have been watching. So thanks to them, you know, this was, this was all possible. And by name, Jim Lowell, Harlan Reiniger, John Meltzer, Peter Outson, and Edward Wang. Um, give them a round of, yeah. And just so you know, not only did they live stream in four rooms simultaneously, but they also got every single thing recorded. So if you missed a panel and you heard from your friends here that you, that you should have gone to that one, don't worry, you can watch them all and we'll get those up as quickly as possible. Um, of course, um, these things cost a lot of money. <laughs> And as a group of students, we did not have any money whatsoever. Um, some of us, I think, have invested a little bit of our own money. <laughs> um, but financially, this would not have been possible without the Program for Global Surgery and Social Change here at Harvard, um, the Center for Surgery and Public Health at Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Med, um, Dr. John Mira himself, actually, and the Boston Children's Hospital Plastic and Oral Surgery Department, um, and then the Harvard Chan Student Surgery Society at the School of Public Health. Um, and a little side note, Paul Farmer and his wonderful research assistant, Katie Krelievitz, actually helped us secure some of these donations. So um, huge thank you to them. We are always in need of donations. So if anybody is listening, <laughs> if you're willing to donate a little bit, we would absolutely love that. Um, so we have a lot of amazing things planned for the future. Um, we already have like thoughts for a global anesthesia panel in the works. Um, we want to host workshops, um, host a symposium like this in the future. So donations always help. Thanks. Um, I did just send out an email to every single person here um, during this panel. We, you did a survey at the beginning. Um, we now need you to do the post-conference survey. If you can do that before you leave, you can just pull it up on your phones. Um, we're actually doing a research study on this symposium, and we're hoping that the results will show the importance of these kinds of efforts and help make them possible in the future. So if this is something you loved and you want to see more of it, please, please fill out the survey. We'd really appreciate it. Um, in fact, we actually plan to make this symposium an annual event, something that we hope can eventually grow into a larger conference for students around the country who want to learn more about global surgery and potentially present research while hearing from those who are already working in the field, like those here. Um, soon we'll be deciding where the next one will be held. It could be here in Boston, but it would actually be a lot more incredible if it was hosted in a different region of the country. So for those of you on the live stream, um, if you're listening to this and you feel a strong desire to host um, a symposium next year, let us know. I know there's some people in Texas watching. Uh, it'd be really cool if it was in Texas. Um, <laughs> just a side note. 
So as far as the Global Surgery Student Alliance, if you want to start a global surgery group or already have one at your school, please let us know. Um, since we started, since we launched everything back in, I think it was like the beginning of January, we've had about 15 schools already start the process of creating global surgery groups. Um, several have already finished that process and they're up on our site. Um, we're more than happy to list your school's global health group if that's where your global surgery work goes through. We're just trying to create a database of all of these efforts so that people know where to, where to look. Um, in the coming months, we'll be developing tools to help students get their global surgery groups off the ground, and we'll be connecting students around the country so that we can collectively improve our efforts. Um, we will be making a database of all the school teams that are forming, um, also a database of global surgery contacts around the country, and hopefully a database of research projects and opportunities for students. So if you have any information you want us to share on your website, we're more than happy to do so. You can just send us an email. Um, we'd also love any articles, op-eds, stories about global surgery from students to um, put on our website. And our hope is that we can be a resource for students around the country um, who want to be involved in global surgery and have ideas of how to contribute to the field. But it's going to take a collective effort from all of us to make that possible. Um, so with that, the last few um, kind of sappy words that I have, because it's been a, it's been a fun um, four-month process. Um, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of this really incredible team, thank you all so much for coming. Um, we look forward to seeing the global surgery movement grow exponentially among students in the U.S. Um, and it's about time that we take on a more united front in our efforts by connecting to students around the world who will be our colleagues as we move forward in our careers. I think we as students have an incredible capacity to change any field we desire. We have unique ways of looking at the world's problems, and we have imaginative solutions that need to be tried. Global surgery has gotten far, but it can go a lot further with students championing those efforts. It is absolutely vital that we make our contributions to the field, and considering how many students came to and live streamed this entire symposium, I think the future of global surgery is pretty promising. Um, so I'd like to close with a quote. Um, Undoubtedly, it is within your power to contribute significantly to shaping the societies of the coming century. Youth can move the world. So if you plan to go into surgery or any other field for that matter, I want you to always keep that quote in mind as you move forward in your careers. Because by working hard, following our passions, and collaborating with our friends and colleagues, we can truly make a difference in this world. Thank you. I will be sticking around. I think some of us will be sticking around. If you have specific questions for us, I will stay here all day if you'd like. Um, would love to help out and talk to any of you that have been emailing us. So thank you. <laughs>